Okay, well I've labeled this ELC 2017 <coughs> quick report. So uh, we'll see how quick it is. Um, so uh, there's kind of a tradition uh, to uh, go over the most recent ELC. Uh, so if you were unable to attend, uh, it was a great conference, a lot of interesting stuff. Um, <clears throat> here's the outline. The outline's kind of longer than it looks because uh, I think each of these is just one slide. But uh, anyway, it was in Prague. It was a lot of fun. I'm not going to comment on what's going on there. <laughs> that was during our, well, I will a little bit. That was during our closing game. It was a really big event this year. Um, so uh, it was in October. It was co-located with several other events. I think there were a total of five events going on at, at that time. Uh, and we had 800 attendees just at ELC Europe uh, and over 2,000 attendees for all of the events combined. So it was a, it was a very, very big event. And it kind of showed we were, we were right at the capacity, I think, of our venue. Uh, so venue, there were some flow, crowd flow issues, uh, especially during the showcase. Uh, but overall, it was, it was pretty good. Uh, they did give, yeah, it, particularly the first day, we tried something we hadn't done before, which is to schedule some embedded sessions against the non-embedded keynotes. And we didn't think, we thought most people would go to the keynotes and, you know, some people would go to these sessions if they were really interested. Well, it turned out that hardly anyway wanted to go to, the, like, Jim Zemlin's talk. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, uh, so we, had, we had these rooms that only had a capacity of, like, 100 people, and we had, like, 400 people trying to get into them. So it was, it was really bad. Uh, but that was just the first day. The other days, we actually had really big rooms. Uh, there were over 60 sessions. And actually, it's really, I'm kind of torn on this. So it's really good to have a, a lot of sessions uh, because you can find something you're interested in, but you often end up also with conflicts. We try really hard in the program committee to avoid conflicts, <coughs> at least topic matter, but if you are, happen to be interested in a bunch of different topics, you can, you can have things collide. And then uh, besides the keynotes, talks, tutorials, exhibits, all that stuff, we also have the hallway track and social events and stuff. So, actually, out of those 60 talks, I was only able to get to 12 of them. Uh, these are the ones that I, that I got, actually got to physically. Um, and uh, you can tell that I was kind of interested in AGL, and I was interested a lot in board farms and in software update. That pretty much covers everything I saw. <laughs> um, but, um, so a couple of thoughts on AGL. Uh, just based on the presentations I saw, I think there were a total of uh, either three or four AGL presentations. Uh, the project is coming along nicely. Um, it's actually deployed in vehicles in the U.S. Uh, there was a plumbing talk in particular by Matt Porter, uh, who had a lot of detail about um, AGL internals. And that was the first time I had really kind of seen uh, their API, some of the binding mechanisms they had. And it was the first time it kind of made me believe that they kind of know what they're doing. <laughs> Which is, it sounds harsh, but I mean, it's like the first time that, when I looked at stuff before, there was kind of collections of software, and you don't know if they're really integrated that well, but it looked like a cohesive stack this time. And so they, I still worry because it's based on QT. Uh, they are in the process of migrating stuff over to HTML5, uh, mm -hmm. but QT has some licensing issues that I think is not good for an open source project. Uh, but it's actually deployed. It's running in cars, so you can't argue with that. Um, anyway, the other thing that I... There was a talk that I found really interesting uh, just because I work with uh, test stuff on test automation and hardware and software using libvirt. So libvirt is this library that allows you to do operations on virtual machines. And it turns out that uh, you can subvert that and have it do operations on real machines. <laughs> so things like powering them on and off or suspending them or uh, getting the status of them. And so there's a company, Linutronics, which is Thomas Gleixner's company, that is doing this uh, using libvirt, and they did some plugins for it, uh, to actually control their board farm, which I thought was really interesting. The, the great thing about it is uh, they have both command line interface, but there is already a libvirt plugin for Jenkins, uh, which is kind of a very common uh, continuous integration interface. So they, once they did their plugin for libvirt, they got all this other stuff for free. Uh, which was really, which was really uh, pretty interesting, uh, and they use it to do uh, all of their RT testing for the RT preamp patch, 
Um, uh, but anyway, it was an intriguing set of features based on already existing software. Uh, nobody really kind of expected it. Um, the other thing that there were there were a number of talks on board farms, a uh, lot of presentations over the last maybe a year and a half. There have been I don't know probably ten presentations on board farms and issues about that. Um, and there's now kind of an initiative to kind of push towards some standards. Everybody's got their own stuff going on. And uh, so at, at this BOF that we had, we actually uh, agreed to set up a page on the eLinux Wiki, start collecting information there. We hijacked one of the lists from the Octo project where we're having discussions on this. Uh, so we're very, very interested in getting people to start collaborating, uh, at least sharing information about what they're doing with their farm, what software they're using. Uh, we'd actually like to standardize on some APIs or some verbs or whatever it is. Uh, what's missing from this, a lot of the small companies, small embedded companies, Pengutronics and Linutronics in Europe um, had a lot of, uh, we, we, we Kenio, uh, had some board farm stuff, uh, but we'd like to see what big companies are doing. A lot of times big companies have their QA departments, they're really not talking to the community about this, it's all behind closed doors. Uh, we'd like to create some standards and make sure we include use cases that cover, cover what they're doing. Uh, so this is actually uh, a big deal, I think. Uh, the other thing I looked at was a secure update and software update. Um, and this is really a critical issue. Just about every talk I see on IoT says if you don't have an update strategy, you do not have security. Uh, because your security is going to get broken over the life of your product. And you have to have a way to, to mitigate that by updating the software. Uh, I went to these mainly from a testing standpoint uh, to see if they, I could use software update to solve a provisioning problem. Uh, uh, for test automation with Fuego, uh, but I came away thinking, nah, it's not going to work. Uh, so, <laughs> which is, uh, you have to change your firmware really to support a lot of these, and uh, not for all of them, but uh, I think there's easier solutions for uh, continuous integration provisioning. Uh, but these tools do look useful. There's a lot more mature than I was expecting for a software update. Um, then after the conference, uh, just like everybody else, I couldn't get to everything I wanted to see. Uh, so I, I looked at some of the videos. Uh, some of the ones I looked at afterwards were boot up time reduction techniques, uh, just because I'm interested in that. Chris Simmons gave a good talk on walking through basic techniques for that. I looked at uh, this replacing x86-64 firmware with Linux and Go was basically how to replace, well, it was not just UEFI, but the firmware that's running on other coprocessors. Um, it's a very, very scary talk about how all that other, so you have the Linux kernel stack that's running on your main CPUs, uh, and we spend all this time hardening it and making it secure, and it turns out that they have this really flaky, insecure software running on the rest of the system that's completely invisible to Linux. Uh, and so they're saying, well, we should do Linux, put Linux on these other processors as well, and then we can control the security on those. Uh, so that was a really interesting talk. And then bash the kernel maintainers. Uh, uh, who was this? This was, um, oh shoot. Well, yeah. Uh, anyway, he, he talked about, um, he had a boss session asking for bit, feedback on uh, Linux kernel maintainer practices. And uh, there was a bunch of issues came up. One of the big ones was that uh, there's just so, there's so many different maintainers to talk to. If you have a cross system patch, it's, it's horrifying to try and get stuff mainline. Um, and they have different ways that they handle patches, different response times, different acceptance policies, which makes things difficult. So actually, the only concrete item that I heard kind of came out of this in kernel summit discussions and maintainer summit discussions was they might start to document some of this stuff, like the maintainer's file or somewhere else. Um, uh, the keynotes. Uh, there, I went to a couple of different keynotes. The ones I thought were interesting were uh, Dirk Linus. Um, and the uh, release process is really, really stable. Uh, we have consistent short release cycles. It removes a lot of the pressure to kind of push stuff into any particular release, uh, which is good. Uh, and, uh, but there's always a need to encourage new contributors. Uh, we, do have, we do worry about like a lot of the maintainers aging out. Um, but being a maintainer is really, really hard. Uh, and uh, so they talked about some of the issues there. Uh, maintainer groups seems to be a good way to solve kind of two problems. A good way to main mentor people, uh, ease people into uh, the maintainer role, uh, encourage new contributors, and to prevent burnout of current maintainers. 
Um, so uh, that seems to be uh, something there. Linus has talked about that a couple times in, in sessions I've seen him give. Uh, kernel testing is getting better. Linus actually mentioned a lot of the fuzzing work. Uh, and Linus still enjoys doing his job, so he doesn't seem to be going anywhere. That's good, because uh, it'd, be, it'd be hard to imagine someone replacing him. Uh, the other keynote that I thought was really interesting was uh, the Siemens keynote by uh, Jan Kiska. And uh, he talked, uh, he some of the issues that you kind of expect, but you know, Siemens is a really, really big company. They're using Linux uh, in a lot of different products, about 40 different products. Uh, and uh, made a couple interesting points. Migration, in, inside the company, migration is always from proprietary to open source. As soon as someone starts to adopt open source, they never like switch back to proprietary. So it's like a one-way one valve, uh, which is interesting. Uh, lots of different tech, uh, Linux technologies are used in different product lines. So you know, in, in, for one product line, uh, Siemens might be using RT preempt. For a different product line, they're using Zenimai. So even though they have real-time things, they're using different, different pieces of the open source uh, stack or different open source technologies to, to solve things. Um, and basically, you have to use open source to manage software complexity. You can't build all this stuff from scratch. He talked a lot about the uh, long life uh, of their products, uh, at least 10 years lifetime, and the software has to be updatable. Otherwise, uh, otherwise you just can't guarantee security. And uh, he talked about the fact that uh, Siemens has learned over the years that the, the cost of maintaining forks, especially with these really long term projects, uh, maintaining their, their own forks with thousands of patches out of, out of uh, tree is just too painful. Uh, so they are trying to really push internally and upstream first thing. And the other thing that they've done a lot of work on is uh, the Siemens employees have done a lot of work on compliance tools and projects around that. So I highly recommend looking at this, you know, little, uh, it's about a 20, 25 minute talk, uh, but uh, some really good points that he made. Uh, the hallway track is really useful. Uh, if you go to one of these events, uh, make sure you just chat with people in the hallway. I learned a whole bunch of stuff, including, this is for the arena sauce guys in the room. <laughs> so I have a bug on my arena sauce, our car board, that I can't reboot it, and uh, Gear gave me a suggestion. I haven't yet tried, but I, I will shortly. Um, I talked to Richard Purdy about the Octo project. He's the lead maintainer there. Greg Crow Hartman actually reported to me a Fuego bug. So that was cool. It was it was not cool because he couldn't get it to work. But <laughs> but uh, uh, we just Jan Simone. I talked to him. Matt Porter. I talked to him about his experiences with NutX. Um, and Kevin Hillman talked about a whole bunch of stuff. I hung out a lot with Kevin Hillman. Discussed the lab in a box and the integration between Fuego and Kernel CI. Uh, Michael Simic asked me what is the Fuego roadmap for hardware testing. Like oh I better get back I better get that on my list again, um, and then I talked to Shua Khan about case self test issues and stuff. So uh, when you go to these events, uh, one of the reasons I only got to 12 sessions is because I was hanging out in the hallway talking to people, uh, and I, I seriously a, a 10 minute conversation can save you like a week of work and make the entire trip valuable if you're paying attention. Uh, so that's important to do. <coughs> Uh, in terms of uh, miscellaneous stuff, Michael Optenacker, we gave him a special award uh, for 11 years of contributions to ELC. That's kind of what we, it's a long story, but we give 11 year awards instead of 10. Uh, he initiated video recordings, which I think ELC was the first one to do that, was to start putting the video uh, session, uh, videotapes or video recordings online for all of our sessions. Uh, and I just think as, as open source, that should be the default for any open source conference. Um, uh, because the whole idea is to share information. Uh, there's a funny thing I asked it during the closing game. I asked a question about the Prague Castle. Uh, the only group that got that 100% got it wrong was the people from the Czech Republic. <laughs> uh, that was because it was misleading wording from Wikipedia, and they're going, like, "No, that's not right." They were all ticked off after the closing game. Uh, but uh, and then I was elected to the Linux Foundation Technical Advisory Board. So. Okay, so uh, the, presentation, there's, uh, the presentations are online. You can see the slides and the videos are already up. Uh, there is an event archive. Um, if you want to go look at the pictures of the event or, or see some of the other information. And uh, the, 
if you want to go, the alternate way to go look at the videos is to go to the Linux Foundation video playlist, which is right there. You want to type that into your browser. Um, and that's it. So that was ELC Europe. Come to ELC or ELC Europe. There are lots of fun. Yeah. So. <laughs> Is there anybody who'd like to add something about the ELC Europe, uh, which you, you, some of you experienced? Yeah, just out of curiosity, how many how many people here were there? So. Mm -hmm. hopefully, hopefully, you had a good time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this time we have a too many attendees. Attendees. Yeah, it was it was super crowded. crowded. Yeah. Super so. crowded. And some of the mess. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much, team. Yeah.